Hi, this is QD Clinic. I'm Jack Cush. QD Clinic is brought to you by Room Now Live, where you can see a free 16 hour educational event in a few weeks from your home. You can register online at roomnow.live. So today's case is entitled Five Pearls on Leflunamide. And it arises from a patient I just saw who came to me and needed some cleanup and some insight regarding the use of leflunamide to control his rheumatoid arthritis. So here are five things that you may not have thought of or may not have heard of in the past. Number one, you can use 100 milligrams once a week instead of 20 milligrams every day. So leflunamide has a half-life of around 18 to 20 days, very long half-life, and therefore it's perfect for once a week dosing. I don't do this from the outset. I usually use the usual doses of 20 milligrams a day to achieve a therapeutic effect. And either because the patient's doing very well or the patient wants to take less medicine or you want to maybe limit some toxicity from the drug, you can take the drug as a once a week dose. I usually take patients who are doing well at 20 milligrams once a day and change them to 100 milligrams once a week. There are some studies showing the efficacy of this. Um, it tends to have a little less toxicity, uh, and it's very well tolerated. You just have to, pa have to have the patient take five 20 milligram tablets once a week, just like they would their methotrexate. You have to be doubly sure they're not going to take it every day, so you need to be careful in patient selection as to who you want to use this in. And again, you want to continue to ask them, are you sure you're taking this? What day do you take this, etc. Again, they could take uh, three 20 milligram tablets once a week, or four, or five. But I find five tends to work for a lot of people. You know, people with low body mass could get away with less, um, and especially if it's being used as used as part of a combination regimen. Uh, 100 milligram tablets are hard to come by. They were out when the drug was first introduced back in 1998. But I find that again, converting patients is a very easy thing to do, uh, and the monitoring is exactly the same. You'll find that again, they'll have either the same efficacy and safety profile, and may have better safety. Uh, item number two, leflunamide is actually uricosuric. It actually does uh, enhance uric acid excretion. Uh, and in those patients who have hyperuricemia, it may be able to lower uh, serum ure urate levels by as much as 20%. So could this be used in patients in whom you have some question as to whether the patient has RA and gout. I always teach you can't have RA and gout. They don't coexist. Well, the literature shows there actually are a few patients. If you look at all RA series, there's about 5 to 8% who have hyperuricemia. Most RA patients tend to have very low uric acid levels. Uh, and similarly, if you look at all gout series, you'll find rheumatoid factor in 5 to, again, 8%. So there are some patients even whom I'm a little confused about. And if you want to cover your bases, uh, uh, Areva or leflunamide might be an effective drug in that instance. And yes, you should monitor uric acid levels if that's your goal of using the drug in that instance. Number three. The package insert says that when you start leflunamide, you need to do a test for TB, PPD or quantiferon or TB spot, because there's actually a higher risk of developing TB or reactivate, reactivating latent TB in patients who take leflunamide. I know it's a head scratcher, but it is one of the DMARDs, it's probably the only DMARD that I know of, that actually requires you, actually, I guess you could say the JAK inhibitors now require you to do TB testing. But methotrexate, plaquenil, sulfazalzine, hydroxychloroquine, all the ones we used in the past, cyclosporin, aprimolase, again, these are not required, but you we do them by convention because we're doing them for all the TNF inhibitors where it's more important. But for this drug, you do need to do a TB test. Uh, and you do need to treat it exactly the same way as you would a TNF inhibitor. There is a higher rate of reactivation of people on, um, on the flunamide. Number four, um, the washout. So when do you do a cholestyramine washout? You could use charcoal, but cholestyramine, also known as Questran, comes in four and eight gram packets. You, well, the issue is whether you're gonna do a full washout for someone who's pregnant and you want to, or wants to get pregnant, and you wanna to totally get the drug totally out of their system. Again, it has a very long half-life. It stays in the enterohepatic circulation for a long time. And to get this uh, fully out of their system, you must use cholestyramine. The regimen, look it up online, but it's basically eight grams TID for 11 days. And you're supposed to, in the case of pregnancy, check for the M1 metabolite that can be measured online with commercial laboratories. 
uh, and it's in the package insert the details as to how you go about doing that. I have found that in toxicity management, whether it be hair loss, um, diarrhea, um, GI symptoms, uh, or, or hypertension, that you might do well to lower the dose uh, and or by using a lesser regimen, and that would be um, either four or eight grams TID for five days. Eight grams TID for five days basically washes out about 80 to 90 percent of the drug out of the enteropathic circulation and can be a good way of managing toxicity. And lastly, the data on pregnancy. We just mentioned you need to do a full 11-day washout for people who want to get pregnant or people who are pregnant. The data on pregnancy and leflunomide exposure are surprising. Leflunomide in the old days, as you know, it was called a category X drug. It is fetotoxic. But yet the data in two large series, these are not really large, one was like 71 patients or 78 patients, the other one was like 51 patients, and all the reports out there show that in women who were on leflunomide who conceived um, after being exposed had no greater incidence of um, uh, fetal malformations and tended to have the same outcomes as do other RA patients. Uh, again, not all those patients were washed out. A lot of them were continued. So while it should be an abortifacient or fetotoxic, the clinical experience shows that it's really not that bad. So I wouldn't um, panic if someone actually got pregnant on this drug. Also, the data on paternal exposure is like other um, DMARDs and biologics. It just simply doesn't matter. Fathers who are taking DMARDs and biologics, with the exception maybe of uh, cyclosporin, not cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide and uh, sulfazalazine, which lower sperm counts. Really, um, DMARDs and biologics have no impact on fertility, on offspring, etc. So, same thing here. If a father's taking leflunomide and uh, the mother gets pregnant, no, re to, no, need, no reason to panic or, um, or send the patient you know, with urgency to the uh, obstetrician. Uh, those are five pearls. I'll, I'll give you one more. Um, I use this drug in managing myositis. It's very effective in managing myositis at the usual RA doses and maybe in conjunction with other drugs. As you know, the drug is broken down into the M1 metabolite, which is also known as teraflunamide. That drug was actually approved, I think, a year or two ago for use in multiple sclerosis. And it's the M1 metabolite that is marketed and it's about 50 to 500 times more expensive than leflunamide. So um, it is being used in other disorders, multiple sclerosis. I use it in myositis with great success. There's a little bit of uh, literature on that, but not a lot. Anyway, we're done with pearls for the day. Tune in tomorrow for more QD Pearls.